Hi, this week we're speaking to Dr. Grosnickel about his recent work on mammalian fossils. So, Dr. Grosnickel, could you please give us a summary of the two papers, please? Uh, sure. So, a uh, vertebrate paleontologist and evolutionary biologist, and I'm interested in the early origin and early diversifications of, of mammals, uh, specifically the mammals that overlap in, in space and time. Uh, with dinosaurs, uh, so that's the Mesozoic era or the the age of dinosaurs. Um, and on this current project, uh, we looked at some mammals from um, uh, the c uh, current publications that just came out. We we looked at uh, some mammals from the Jurassic of China, and uh, they were especially fascinating because they have um, uh, wings or what we call patagia, which uh, modern gliding mammals have, uh, which indicates that they were gliding mammals, um, which is fascinating. Because, you know, 100 million years before uh, modern uh, gliding mammals uh, evolve. Uh, and so this is just kind of an exciting uh, topic uh, for us to explore and look at. And the, the fossils were amazingly preserved. So we have full skeletons of these fossils that we look at. Uh, most early mammals are known from teeth and little jaw fragments and occasional little bone here or there, but these have uh, almost entire skeletons. So we can examine these in, in much more um, uh, thorough analyses. And that's what uh, gets myself and the collaborators excited about this project. And so these um, fossil uh, mammals, what were they sort of eating? Um, and you're saying that they're gliders. Are they similar to like sugar gliders or like gliding squirrels? Uh, they would be very similar to gliding squirrels. Um, and in that they're um, the kind of the patagia or wings attached from basically kind of the, the, the wrist to the ankles, um, which is what modern uh, uh, flying squirrels have. Um, and they also would have been fairly um, small. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of modern rodent, gliding rodents are also um, pretty small, like kind of a rat size or, or smaller. Um, but they also had um, a, a unique characteristic that modern uh, flying squirrels uh, don't have, and th that's that they were probably roosting or hanging uh, from branches. Um, and that you see in modern uh, bats um, and modern uh, flying lemurs, which aren't actually lemurs, but they're uh, nicknamed flying lemurs uh, or colugos. Um, and so we re reconstructed these when we have kind of drawings of these in our, our publication as from these trees with all four limbs kind of grasp onto these branches, um, which is just kind of a unique uh, set of characteristics that uh, you don't see uh, very often, um, except for maybe in, again, modern flying lemurs. Uh, so was that sort of maybe like a protection from predators or was it because um, of the foods they were eating? Um, so sort of, were they vegetarians or are they eating maybe insects? So they're uh, probably more... Um, eating more plant products, although um, it's kind of hard to tell. It looks like they could be kind of a mix. Um, they do have some kind of sharp cusps in some spots of the um, sharper parts of their teeth that would be good at um, uh, poking into insects as well. Uh, but most of the evidence supports them being herbivorous or vegetarian, eating mostly plant parts. Um, it's a little tricky to, to figure out exactly what they were eating because the plant life back then was very different than what it is today. Um, there aren't the, the flowering plants that dominate today, um, just weren't, hadn't evolved yet um, in the Jurassic. So it would have been, um, they would have been eating things like uh, ginkgos and cycads and uh, weird plants um, that, uh, 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 well, we consider weird plants uh, that were dominant back in, the, in uh, the Jurassic period. And so we think they're eating like seeds um, and um, small kind of equivalent of what would be like small fruits today, um, but from different plants. Um, and that would have made up most of the diet in our opinion. So they would have been gliding from, from maybe tree to tree for food products um, and not, not so much for insects or for avoiding predators, but probably more so for um, finding food um, as they kind of you know, travel from tree to tree. Oh, that's really interesting. And um, so it was sort of they're like traveling and they're eating more sort of like leaf type plants because there weren't any flowers. So you sort of think of lots of flowers being around, but it would be more sort of leaves and like stems and things like that. Yeah. So the, there were um, um, gymnosperms or seed bearing plants. Um, there were seed ferns. So there was a lot of seeds out there to eat. 
um, but they weren't flowers to go with those seeds, or at least a flat like flowers like we think of today. There may have been other plants that evolved kind of flower-like things to attract pollinator, or attract insects, but um, it would have been different than what we're used to today. So yeah, they would have been eating um, uh, probably a lot of seeds, but also other bits of the, the, the plant products, uh, buds and leaves. Um, there was a lot of uh, fern plants as well, so maybe uh, products of uh, ferns and, and uh, other seed plants. So they're eating quite a different diet because of the plants that were available to modern mammals, but what kind of mammal would you say they're most like today? Because um, they're not related to like sugar gliders and flying squirrels, are they? No, so uh, so again, they, they probably um, in size, there's, there's a small... Um, uh, there's some very small gliders called uh, scaly-tailed gliders or anomalurids that they're a type of rodent. Um, and they would have been maybe about the same size as those. So that's probably what is size-wise, that's what they're most similar to. Um, but those have wings or patagium that attach to their elbows, not to their wrists like these guys. So the, the wings were very different um, in those compared to um, uh, what we see in the fossil record. Um, and, and so they would have been a little bit more like um, uh, flying squirrels in the respect of their wings and how those attach. And then as I mentioned before, um, because they were roosting or hanging upside down, they would have also looked kind of similar to very, look like very small versions of flying lemurs or uh, colugos. Um, and all of, the, all of those modern groups of gliders all eat uh, plant products. Um, and so this kind of matches with that hypothesis that the, these gliders, these were gliders because they're, um, they match up not only, you know, in terms of their, um, their wings and their proportions of their, their limbs match up very similarly to modern gliders, but they're also their diets are very similar to modern gliders, which at least mammal gliders that tend to eat plant products. So there's a lot of similarities to modern gliders. Um, so what does that tell us a bit about how mammals did evolve um, and when all the um, adaptations were taking place? So yeah, that's, it's an interesting or fascinating um, example of convergent evolution where the different lineages, evolutionary branches on the evolutionary tree have evolved to look very similar to one another even though they're not closely related. And what's What's especially fascinating about this is this occurred 160 million years ago, um, and so you know we have these, and they are not even the fossils we're looking at aren't even technically mammals. They're outside of the mammal branch of the evolutionary tree. They're just outside, so they're just kind of like a, a sister group or cousins of mammals, and so it shows us that. It, it didn't take the evolution of mammals to get this ecological radiation of, of species, that there is actually many of this before we even get to the mammal part of the tree, evolutionary tree, that were diversifying in terms of ecology and diet and adaptations. Um, and, and during that time, you have um, you have mammals that were good at digging, you have mammals that were good at climbing trees, you had mammals that were good at gliding, as, as we show. And so you have a variety of, of ecologies uh, and ecological niches that have been, are being filled um, way before we get into the modern radiation of, of modern mammals. Oh, that's really interesting, thank you. Um, so this collection of fossils, um, the preservation looking at the papers looks amazing. Um, how many more fossils do you think are going to be present and how, well, like, what's next as research? How is it going to be expanded? Uh, well, it's 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 a little tricky because of it's coming out of China and um, and to get permits there and to do um, uh, paleontological work um, is still kind of evolving how that how that um, happens. Um, there's just a little bit more kind of government control and um, uh, regulation than we're used to um, in in the United States. So. Um, I don't know how much more work will be done, but I'm sure there's there's so much um, excitement about those fossils and so much publicity of those you know about those fossils. I'm sure those fossil beds will be continued to search, uh, be searched pretty thoroughly, um, and I'm sure they'll find many many more fossils. So this is I think this is just the beginning, um, and these these fossils in, in this fossil bed and um, this rock formation um, have been 
they've been published on for the last 10 or 15 years. So there's about 10 or 15 years of research. But if you compare that to, you know, some of the rock formations in North America that are famous for dinosaurs, like the big long neck dinosaurs from the Morrison formation, there's people back in the 1800s that were, that were, you know, describing those and digging those up. And they, there's still people out there digging those, digging those up and looking at those rock formations, uh, you know, almost 150 you know, years later. So um, I'm sure these, these fossil beds in China will just can be continued to um, uh, be dug up and searched. And I'm sure they'll continue to find some amazing fossils. And, and like you mentioned, they're just exceptionally preserved, um, which is really rare for fossils and especially small mammal fossils. It's usually, again, teeth and little jaw fragments that we find. And this is just, uh, you know, except an exceptional um, um, spe specimen. Uh, it's so um, positive that there's like so much that can be done with it. Um, I was just wondering, um, so what got you interested in this project and this area of research? Um, so I am, uh, I, I taught high school biology for four years um, after um, uh, graduating from um, college and uh, just got kind of fascinated by evolutionary biology and kind of rekindled a love for paleontology that I had as a kid that like many people have as a kid and, uh, and found a, um, a master's program, uh, a graduate program at uh, Indiana University um, and uh, just really um, uh, enjoyed the, the research I did on early mammals for that um, project and uh, for my thesis for that. And I've just kind of stuck with it ever since. And um, have just, I, I think I like the idea of them being kind of the underdog to the dinosaurs and that there's this 150 million years of kind of mammal evolution that occurred during the age of dinosaurs that um, where they were the kind of getting picked on, they're the small little uh, creatures that were running around trying not to get stepped on by the big mean dinosaurs and and they end up kind of uh, persevering and diversifying and I think it's just a really fascinating story so it just kind of sucked me in several years ago and I've, I've stuck with it. Yeah, I can completely understand it is really fascinating hearing about them. Um, we're going to put a link to both papers below this and um, thank you so much for doing the interview and um, it was really really fascinating we'll also put some of the images in as well because i think it's quite important for people to see exactly what they looked like all right thank well, you thank so you. much yeah, thank you for having me this bye